This is Kingdom Embassy, Embassy Ministries, and um, welcome. I am honored to be here today to introduce um, Pastor Manny. He will be preaching today and blessing us um, with a message that the Lord gave him. And um, he gave me a, he texted me yesterday and he said, hey, Dennis, um, would you be willing to share a, a word with us um, tomorrow night, today? And um, I said, sure, absolutely. I'm always honored um, when they ask me to do that. So I asked him what it was about and he said, forgiveness versus reconciliation. And I was like, oh, great. Okay, so I have no idea exactly where he's going with that, which is okay. So I prayed and I feel like the Holy Spirit led me immediately to a situation that I've actually, that was personal to me. And I shared it with you guys and it was about my dad who wasn't actually there for me. Um, and because he wasn't there for me and when he was in the hospital the other day, he said something very strange, and I shared it with you guys really quick, and he said, wow, Junior, I'm, I'm a junior, I'm Dennis Junior. He said, wow, Junior, you, you, you must really love me. You're, you're calling me all the time, and you must really care how I'm doing in the hospital. And, and I was like, of course, I don't know if some of you remember, of course I do, I'm, I'm your son. And, and I didn't think about how weird that statement was until after thinking about forgiveness versus reconciliation. It was like, huh. Well, I think I left you guys with thinking even to yourself, some of your faces at that time was, well, that's weird. That's a weird statement for a father to say to a son. Well, I thought about it and I, I figured, I, I think exactly, I know why he said it the way he said it. And it was because no more than six to eight months prior to him going to the hospital, we're having our little chat maybe once or twice a year, all right? And I'm always the one that initiates these chats. And he, um, he tells me that he's about to have cataracts. Something's going on with his eye. And I'm listening to him and he's telling me how he won't be able to go to work and do his job. And he sprays lawns for a living, 25, 30 years, whatever it is. And um, I said, wow. I said, no, you gotta be able to go to work. I said, listen, I work from home. I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll come and I'll drive for you and I'll bring my computer and I'll, I'll do my work in the car. And he said, what? And I said, yeah, I was like, I can't have you out there and either not being able to work or you know, trying to drive your truck and get into an accident. I don't wanna hear something happens to you. And he was astonished, he was, he was stunned. Like, wow, I can't believe you would do that for me. Well, fast forward about a week later, I decided to do it and it was the worst decision I ever made. I, um, I saw a side of my father that, because I wasn't around him, that I've never saw before. And it was so bad, I won't get into it, like Manny would say, I can't really give you details, but it was bad enough for me the next day, it only took one day, to have my wife on the, on the phone, he doesn't know it unbeknownst to him, but her getting to witness just how compulsive this, this, this gentleman is, and it was just one of these things where it's just, just everything about it, and what it caused for me was for me to have a seizure within the next few days. And I was so stressed out, and I couldn't get past everything that was going on. And that's why he made that statement to me, because eight months later, here it is, he's in the hospital sick, something's going on with his heart, and he's shocked that I'm, I care enough to talk to him every day to speak to his wife, to find out what's going on with him and how's everything going. So when Manny mentioned um, repentance or forgiveness versus reconciliation, that's what came on my heart. Biblically, what else came on my heart was Joseph. I thought about Joseph and I said, wow, I would imagine Joseph was torn over what his brothers did to him. Everyone knows the story, so I won't go into it. But what I will say is, I think Joseph was probably thinking about what his brothers did every day, every day of his life at least once or twice a week as he's in jail, imprisoned, as he's a slave. Think about all the things he was going through. And then as his brothers walk up to get food and he sees them, was he sore? Absolutely he was sore. He put them through some stuff before he finally broke down and he allowed them to go and get their father, so on and so forth. So what's the parallel? Well, the parallel is 
My dad probably figured that I was so mad at him, just like Joseph's brothers figured that he was going to be sore. And they were scared out of their mind once they found out, even when they found out and seen how happy Joseph was. There, my dad probably thought I would never talk to him again. Why is that? Well, he knew that I fell into a seizure, but my wife and him exchanged some words, and that was Mama Bear. I don't know what was said, but Mama Bear went into work with him, and it was whatever was said was said. She repented, don't, don't, don't judge, all right? And I'm pretty sure Joseph Brothers thought that if I ever saw my brother again, he'll never talk to me. I sold him, right? I hated him so much because he was dad's pet. So my actions showed my dad that I forgave him. My calling him every day and checking on him every day and showing him my love, it actually led him to say something as silly as, wow, Junior, wow, son, you really do love me. It makes a little more sense now? I thought it would. Just like Yeshua, Joseph showed forgiveness and reconciliation when he cried with them, when he dined with them, when he sent them home to get the father and his father came and he um, gave them land to live in um, there in Egypt. He showed that he forgave as well as he reconciled through those small actions. He's showing, listen, I have no resentment towards what you guys did to me. So I want you to ask yourself this question. Is there anyone in your life I see a lot of you guys thinking already that you should be reconciled to, that you need to forgive. Ask yourself that question. Because remember what it says in scriptures. If you bring a gift to the altar, what did Jesus say? If you realize that you need to forgive someone or, or you're, you have something against your brother, he said, leave your gift at the altar. Go and be reconciled. And once you're reconciled, he said, come back, and then you can present your gift. Amen? Amen. 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 Good evening. If this is your first time with us here, my name is Manny Fernandez. You're sitting with us here at Kingdom Embassy Ministries. Our website goes by the same name, kingdomembassyministries.org. If you've not visited that website, please do so. We have a tremendous amount of information that we're very, very proud that we put up on the website for you to uh, learn, watch videos, like the one that we're going to upload later. And following up on what Dennis just said, a handful of weeks ago, um, I taught a, a message that was entitled, Bitter Less. And the, the very section of scripture that I used to preach that message was the scripture that he just reference which was Joseph and what he actually endured in his life and we looked at the fact of how his brothers treated him we saw what they did to him after he told them these two dreams that he had and how it is that because his father had a preference for him that the Bible says that they hated him and then later on as he after he got sold into slavery and he goes into Pharaoh's house and he gets uh, let's just say, blamed for a rapacious act upon the uh, Pharaoh's wife, he gets jailed in, in, uh, improperly. But we highlighted the fact that his countenance never fell as he went through this, through this endeavor. He went to jail and he had favor with the Lord, the Bible says, but the Lord was with Joseph. And it says it several times. And the reason why today's message it's entitled what is entitled forgiveness versus reconciliation is because we saw how he had the capacity to do that but is that always the case in our life is that always the case when we have something that's happened to us where we are able to forgive and to reconcile and I know that my brother Dennis just referenced a section of scripture if you have anything against your brother Leave, the, leave your offering at the foot of the cross or at the altar and be reconciled to your brother. 
the preceding part of that verse is what matters. If you have anything against your brother. If you don't have anything against your brother, there's nothing you have to reconcile about, right? Interesting thinking. So reconciliation is not a given in every situation. Once you recognize, as I told you in the last teaching that we had together, that you're harboring some type of bitterness towards somebody and you're able to deal with that, the natural procession that needs to happen is to understand how to go about forgiveness. And we have plenty of that in the Bible. Once we begin to flush out the bitterness out of our heart, that next step should be for us to actively engage in conflict resolution. Our spring, springboard section of scripture today for us to kind of pay attention to how this would look like in our life is going to be Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 17. And it says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we are so thankful that we had your, your word in our hand and that our heart is in yours. That by the reading of your holy writ, we can recognize what you desire for each and every one of us to apply into our daily living, both in the here and now, and as we get closer to eternity for the day that you call each and every one of us home. I pray, Lord, that this message will find its way into the cracks and crevices of the hearts that are represented here and online. And that indeed, whatever it is that you speak to each and every one, both individually or collectively, that is directly from you. That you uh, push my voice out of the way and that is yours that flows. That is yours that finds that fertile soil in each and every one's heart and that fruit may be given for your kingdom, for your glory. And it's in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. This is a very interesting section of scripture, and it's kind of interesting for many different reasons, because the chapter begins with the disciples coming to Jesus and asking him who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I can pretty much guess that Peter was sitting somewhere nearby because that would be his type of character. But Jesus moves into the direction of asking for a child to come and to put them in their midst and starts telling the disciples that unless you become like this child and that you have a childlike faith and so forth and so on. And then he goes down the list of different things and then he gets to this section of scripture. This is something that I have never in my life seen be utilized properly in any congregation, on any church. You hear all the time about, oh, go Matthew 18, that person. If you've been, in, if you've been a Christian long enough, you've heard this. Go Matthew 18, that individual, because they wronged you. Interestingly enough, this can be used at the personal level, but it's is a lot broader than that. Because when, when the Bible says, if your brother sins against you, if somebody were to be sinning here, even though you're not directly sinning against everyone else, you are in a sense simply because we're all part of one body. But we're going to be looking at this from the perspective of that which Jesus is imparting to the hearer. The very first thing that gets my attention is when it says, your brother sinning against you. 
And then he breaks this down by providing a step-by-step -step process to forgiveness. So now that your brother has done this deed towards you, he says, go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. So what should be the tone scale of that conversation? When you go to confront a person that has done something wrong, if they've done it to you, in most cases, we're going to want to stand on our own soapbox, are we not? And a lot of times it's going to be our emotions that we're going to be speaking on our behalf instead of ourselves. We're going to be wanting to be heard from the mountaintop. You're going to be like, I want an apology. Or before you get there, you might say, I want to get even. I want some revenge. Well, the opposite of that is what should be happening. You should be praying to God before you go meet with anyone who's done something wrong. And you should be asking God to take control of your emotions. You should be figuring out the proper way to communicate the circumstances to this person. One thing I've told many people before when it comes to this section of Scripture is, write it down. Write down the facts of what you're talking about. Because the moment that the conversation ensues, I can assure you, it's going to be going in 20 different directions. But you did this, and you said that, and before you know it, it just snowballs. Here's what Ephesians 4.29, which Dr. Jeff actually referenced last week in his teaching. I was sitting up there, and I was sitting next to Josh, and I said, that's in my next week's teaching. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, watch this, as fits the occasion. As fits the occasion. So if you know that this is going to be a polarized conversation, you have to be ready for that occasion. That it may give grace to those who hear. So the first order of business is you have to go. But see, if you're the wrong one, God is telling you that you have to be the initiator. How many times do you actually sit there and wait for the person to come and talk to you or come and reach out to you about this? My wife hates this about me because if somebody has done something to me, I will go and ask them and talk to them about it. But the opposite of that is also true. And the part that she hates is when something may seem like it has happened with somebody else and they feel offended in a certain way by something I may have said or done, I'll wait for them to come to me. Because that's what the Bible says. I'm not going to let them off the hook. If I did something to you personally, come and tell me about it. Let's have a conversation that says, whatever the case is, and I will be glad to give you my hearing and say to you, you're right. Or if you're not right, I'll tell you you're not right. And then we would have to move to the next stage of the conversation. But we'd rather sit, sulk, and sour. Kind of get stewed up in our juices and our emotions. And just figure out who it is that you want to go tell. Because the interesting fact is, it tells that you have to go and tell them and them alone. But what we normally will do is we'll go tell everybody besides the person that needs to hear it. Isn't that true? Usually, you're going to want to find some support in your hurt feelings. And so what you do is you end up going and telling everyone that even doesn't have a business about it. And you might even say, well, you know, suppose something happened and, uh, to you like this. And you try to be very... Um, non-factual, so that they can't figure out who it is. And you want to kind of talk to that person in a way where they can't piece things together. But usually it's within the same circle. So they might have already heard whispers from somebody else about it. And before you know it, you're just kind of like, Bleh. You're just letting it all out, the person this, the person that. And it'll just go from one person to the next. But the person that needs to hear it knows absolutely nothing about the situation. That is not good. That's not what Jesus says. 
So the first thing that I wanted to mention to you in this is that God wants us to develop our communication. The second thing that I want you to pay attention to that He wants us to do is to develop our character. How easy is it for you to get up and confront somebody about something? Is it easy? If you're, if you're really honest with yourself. It's not the easiest thing to do for most people because most of us are not trained in doing it. Most of us don't even want to deal with the fact of whatever the case might be that took place. Watch what happens in Leviticus 19 and 16. It says, You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. So like I was just telling you now that everybody else knows about it, and you're having a grand old time slandering the other person, here's a verse for you. Don't go around slandering. And this is a common practice. And it's utterly scary. Quite a few years ago, my wife and I was befriended by a gentleman who had come out of a certain lifestyle, and I, I'll leave that lifestyle out for the purpose of smaller years. And we were very welcoming of this person simply because that's what we do. We don't, we don't look at a person's past as to determine who they are today and to not show them the love of Christ. So we, we took to this person and we, we built a, what we considered to be a fairly strong relationship. This person was spending time in our family uh, gatherings and many other things. But at one point in time, it seemed like the relationship was turning in a weird direction. And uh, this person confronted me about my own willingness to want to spend time with him on my own and how it is that if he moved into my neighborhood that I'd be spending more time there than at my own house. And I said, my friend, I want to make sure that I say this lovingly. That would never, ever happen. I'm not sure what your thoughts are, but let's just say that that would never, ever happen. Well, this person decided to take it upon themselves to go tell the pastoral staff at the church that I was an elder at that I was a hurt person going around hurting other people. And so a couple of the pastors that he actually spoke this to, who happened to be personal friends of mine, one of them called me to go have lunch with him, just out of the blue. Never had lunch with the person. We were kind of friendly, but we were never like friends like that. And so we're sitting there eating, and he says, hey, tell me, tell me about this friendship with this gentleman. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And I said, it's very odd that you come and ask me something about this individual so shortly after what took place last week. And I'm not going to ask you to divulge any information, but I want to tell you that whatever you may have been told, if the fact of the matter is that you think there's some validity to it, that person should be here in this meeting. That person should be sitting here in this meeting. Because... If there's been an accusation made, you're bypassing every step of the, of the Matthew 18 conversation. So that person basically disappeared from our life after that. But a couple of years down the road, I get a phone call from him. And he says, I want to I wanna come to your house and I want to sit down with you and your wife if at all possible. So I said, yeah, by all means, come on over. So he came, sat down on my table. He was very apologetic for what he did and how he tried to trash my name around church campus with several different people. But what happened was he came to find out that he couldn't gather any steam behind that because by God's grace, my character, that everyone that he spoke to, did not allow him to believe that. So he apologized for it. I accepted his apology. And he wanted to pick things right up where they were left off. And I said to him, I said, that part we are going to take very slowly, one step at a time, and we're going to measure that accordingly. 
Why? Because in the process of reconciliation, you have to make sure that you don't make the same mistake again. Because if you do, then the wound gets even deeper. And the second time around, it's going to be worse than the first time. Well, he didn't like that. He didn't like the parameters. He didn't like the fact that reconciliation was not going to be exactly how he had imagined it would be. And that thing was just be hunky-dory like nothing ever happened. And um, I've never seen him again. Never seen him again. Never heard from him again. I don't have any old will towards him. And that forgiveness versus reconciliation was lived out right there. It was lived out not because of me, but because the other person wasn't willing to accept. See, that's what reconciliation is about. It takes both parties to be able to function in that capacity. It's not just one-sided. See, God wants to reconcile with you and with me. But He's providing that, and you have to accept that, and you have to repent of your actions in order for you to reconcile to Him. The one caveat to that is that we're not God. And what He asks of us is to always forgive. Psalms 101 verse 5 says, Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. Proverbs 11 and 9, With his mouth the godless man will destroy his neighbor, but by knowledge the righteous are delivered. Romans 1 29 says, They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. Slanderers, and watch this. If you're a gossip or you're a slanderer, you're coupled in with the haters of God. Insolent, haughty, boastful, investors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. There are not many people that I know can practice not being a slanderer or being a gossip and I've said this before, I remember saying this before, but it's this gentleman here in the very front row, his name is Stephen. Sorry, Stephen. I've only known him for about four years, but I can tell you one thing. In every single opportunity there has ever been to either gossip about somebody or to slander somebody, that man has never taken the opportunity to do that. As a matter of fact, there was a year and a half or so ago, maybe two, where he was telling us about a conference that he went to, a prophetic conference that he went to. And the people there apparently were up to something or doing something that wasn't quite exactly what he would have expected or, or so, but he never once slandered their character. And he could have had the opportunity to do that, but he didn't. And in any other opportunity that I've ever seen him, where there could be that chance, he won't do it. And for that, for that, that capacity, I can tell you without a shadow of doubt that I hope to get to that place myself sooner than later because it's such an easy, slippery slope. I read to you that verse and I, I mentioned to you that the gossips and the slanderers are coupled in with the haters of God. How does that tip the needle for you to recognize that action as something that none of us should practice or should be easy given to doing? Jesus says in the next part of that verse, He says, you have gained your brother. And that would be fantastic because that will show maturity on both parties. And I don't know if you recognize this. We'll know more about this towards the end. But when it talks about the fact of telling the whole church, when it says here that you have gained your brother, you realize that you can lose people while they're in your church? Because for you to gain them back, you have to have lost them first. So while you're sitting here and something happens and maybe we don't see you anymore, nobody knows why, we could have lost you. 
for something that was done inappropriately or something that was said inappropriately. But so what happens when the, the, the culprit of the actions does not agree with the allegations? Now, now you can go ahead and trash them to everyone, right? <laughs> no, you can't. Of course not. It says, verse 16, but if it does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Let me ask you, where does that come from? Where does that two or three witnesses come from? You know, it comes from the Torah, exactly. From where? From Deuteronomy, specifically. It's a civil law. I mentioned that last week, if you remember. It's a civil law, and it says in Deuteronomy 19.15, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. So we're to tell him or her, their fault against us, between us and them alone. And see, the reason why that is, that you're supposed to have told them that alone the first time, is so that when you bring these two or three people with you, they don't have any biased position to the conversation. Because if you've already prepped them up with what you think was done wrong, they're aching to not listening to the whole thing. They've already come with a predisposed, predisposed mind as to what happened. But guess what? If you don't say anything to anybody, you keep it to yourself, you bring one or two people with you and say, I need you to meet with me for this particular purpose. I can't share the reason why right now, but I need you there. And once we're there, we'll clue you, we'll clue you in as to what's, what's going on. I mean, you see, the, you see the, the, the grand idea that, that, that Jesus is presenting to us? He's doing that for a very specific reason. Because if the fact of the matter is that there is something that was done incorrectly and it needs to be addressed, the two people that are going to be there or the one person that's going to be there in addition to should not come in there with a mind that's already bent towards giving you an out. I have a friend of mine. He's been a friend of mine for, I don't know, 15, 16 years. And when he wants accountability on something, he calls like 10 or 12 people. And it's, it's the one, I've always noticed this, it's the one, two or three that agree with him that he sides with. All the other ones that are speaking against what he wants or he, what he likes, the, he doesn't like what they're saying. But the one or two that agree with him, he's right in part with them and he wants to, he wants to call them into the conversation for what he's being held accountable to. That's no way to be held, be, uh, be held accountable by anybody. If you're finding people who are going to give you an out, then nobody's holding you accountable to anything. And it's the same thing with this. The fact of the matter is that you need to be held accountable and you bring somebody else in your conversation that's already prepared to not look at the facts accordingly, then you're not going to be held accountable either. And so they need to become witnesses of this interaction. And then by doing so, they're going to establish the evidence that they've witnessed. So in verse 17, in the cursory reading of this verse, it says, if he refuses to listen to them. So it's, it's obvious that the person in this example is guilty of the actions, right? The reason why I told you earlier about this verse never ever being utilized in a church accordingly is because of what I'm about to tell you next. And it's called, it's called church discipline. Any one of you guys ever heard the term church discipline? I was maybe about two or three years into the faith, and uh, I was brought into a deacon meeting, and they were discussing church discipline. And I was kind of like dumbfounded. I'm like, church discipline? Isn't that like an oxymoron? I mean, people are already here in church, and they're supposed to be, you know, I thought everybody was holy, like everybody had a halo on their head, you know? Little did I know that that wasn't the case. And this whole church discipline thing was a, was a real thing. So we'll go over the steps. You're going to go, the step number one. Number two, you're going to tell them their, their faults. They hear you've gained your brother. It would be ideal if it was on, on one and out. If they don't hear you, tell them the, you tell the church. 
And here's what 2 Corinthians says in 12.20. For I fear that perhaps when I come I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling. Jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. 1 Corinthians 5 and 11 and 12, it says, But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? And you see, when a person has done something that they're impenitent about, that they choose to not repent, that they choose to continue to live in, after you've confronted them yourself, after you brought the one or two witnesses and they've agreed with the fact that there's this thing going on, what do you do? Tell everyone in the church. Have you ever been at a church where anybody does that? I've never been in one. I've never been in one. But why is that? I can tell you why. Because that doesn't sell very well. You're not going to put a lot of people in a chair when you're exposing their deeds. But I can tell you this. If we did do that in our churches, the people that are going to be in your church are going to be the ones that are hopefully not becoming better posers that they're going, to be become, they're going to become stronger Christians who are truly going to be living out that which they're practicing by reading the Word, by praying, by spending time in fellowship, all of these different things. Now, you may think that that's a horrible thing to do to tell, somebody, tell somebody's business in the wide open, but it's really not because if you love that person, And if you really want to see that person be restored into the faith accordingly, you will do these things. It's in the Bible for a reason. It's not just there for us to see the, 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 the black ink on white paper and just overlook it. That church discipline that I'm referring to you to is necessary for the proper edification of the body of Christ. I can tell you this, and I hope that this is the case. If, if anyone here was living in blatant sin and you were confronted by one person and then the, by the one and the two and the other and then the church came in and talked to you and you still didn't receive it and we exposed that to anybody, my hope is that you will see that that's being done out of love and not being done out of hate or any kind of castigation you got to take issue with the Word of God, not with anybody practicing that. But if you've ever seen a church doing that, please raise your hand and let me know where. I've never seen it. J.E. Adams, in his book, Godliness Through Discipline, wrote, As Christians, we should never fear change. We must believe in change so long as it is change-oriented, toward godliness. The Christian life is a life of continual change. Wayne Gruden said this, the power of the church is his God-given authority to carry on spiritual warfare, proclaim the gospel, and exercise church discipline. What is the ultimate purpose for this church discipline? is for you to gain your brother, for you to establish him back to the faith. The purpose is not for you to get your accolades if somebody wronged you. It's not for you to have your feelings heard appropriately or somebody apologize to you if it's an individual situation. It's for that person to be properly brought back into the body of Christ and that we can all function accordingly as whatever we are, whether you're an arm or an eye or an ear, Whatever, whatever God gifting He's giving you, for you to be able to apply that into that body. His ultimate purpose is for to keep His sheep in His sheepfold, and for there to be productive fellowship. Romans 15 and 14 says, "I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, 
that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. God desires that His people grow together because when we don't grow together, we grow apart. That's a guaranteed fact. If I spend time in the Word of God studying, and if I spend time in prayer, and we don't try to do that in our own personal times the same way, before you know it, you'll be the one that's being called in the Bible as if you're still drinking from milk. And His desire is for each and every one of us to grow in the same capacity. And that's why we congregate. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, it says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is why we fellowship. This is why we break bread together. This is why we pray together. Because as we do these things, the body strengthens. Our abilities are strengthened. We can do more work for the kingdom of God if we do these things. 2 Corinthians 2, 6-8 For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. James chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Think of that verse in the light of what we've been talking about in Matthew chapter 18. We want to be able to recover this soul from death. We want to be able to cover a multitude of sins. We want to be able to bring back this sinner and restore him to fellowship. But we can't do those things if our emotions get in the way. And if all we want to make sure is that we are the ones that are being heard and that we are right standing on our own mountaintop. person who was wrong was called to forgive all along and Jesus said this numerous times including at the very end of this gem chapter I'm going to read a little bit of, uh, of 18 and 21 it says then Peter came up and said to him Lord how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times Peter 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 never fails to open his mouth only to change which foot he's got in it. And that's the common human behavior, common human thinking. You know, how often should, how, how many times am I going to forgive that person for what they did? You guys know Jesus' reply already. It's a little bit lengthy, but I think it's worth your reading. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. By the way, I'm reading out of the ESV. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what, he had, what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went. Let's see and reported to their master all that had taken place. And his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers 
until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I wrote it in my notes this way. Your forgiveness of others is not dependent on whether they repent or not. I told you earlier, you're not God. But here's what's interesting, and I hope you get the reason why Jesus is giving us this verse. We are the wicked servant that was forgiven the 10,000 talents. That is the debt that none of us could pay. That is the debt that none of us could pay. I don't know if you ever looked to see what a talent was. Some people believe it could have been anywhere between $400,000 to $500,000 value back in 2006 when I first read that. Whoa. And you know economics, right? So the number of today could be way higher. So if you do 10000 times 400000 at the least, that's a big number. And if any one of us owed that today, we'll be up a river without a paddle. But that is the reality of what our life would look like before salvation with God. And that's the reason why the Lord's Prayer says, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's easy to come to the foot of the cross and say to Jesus, Lord, I need a Savior. I repent. Forgive me of my sins. And so because of that repentance, you begin the reconciliation process with your Maker. He's forgiven your sins. But then somebody wrongs you, and you want to hold up your fist. So you're doing the same thing, or I'm doing the same thing, that this guy had happened when he was forgiven his debts, but then he goes out and he wants to choke his servant for what he owes him, which is nowhere near what he, what he owed to the master. And so therein lies the rub of the matter. How should we forgive? First, we should forgive freely. You believe that you should only forgive after this or after that. You fill in your blank. Because I think to a, to a large degree, our, our forgiving capacities vary with each personality. And you might have certain barometers that you believe should happen for, for you to, to forgive the person that wrongs you. We'd rather just browbeat the offender and then maybe after that you'll forgive. You know, you, you, you'll let the person hear all sorts of things about what happened. And then afterwards, maybe you'll forgive them. Second step, we should forgive fully. Don't just tell yourself that you have forgiven that person. Don't. Because if you do that, you're lying to yourself. You know when you have truly forgiven somebody, don't you? I'm pretty sure you know. Don't pretend it didn't matter. Because that's just prideful on our part. And as we start getting closer to the end, lastly on this section of how we're supposed to forgive, we need to forgive finally and totally. I heard about this guy who went to a, a doctor, psychologist, and he tells his psychologist, getting pushed over here, he tells the psychologist that his wife, whenever they get into an argument, she gets historical. And he says, you don't mean historical, you mean hysterical. And he says, no, 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 I mean historical. And he says, what are you talking about? Well, as soon as something happens, she starts telling me everything I did wrong. And she just keeps telling me the same thing over and over again. She just starts telling me our history. And we do the same thing. We don't forgive somebody finally or totally. What we end up doing is we just keep bringing up the past. And we just keep on regurgitating the same conversation over and over. Especially if somebody close to us in our life. Because if they are close to us in our life, then there's a likelihood that things can happen, right? And so as soon as there's a need for forgiveness, you don't do it unless you start telling them everything they've done wrong again. And you just keep piling it on. And that happens a lot in marriages. I've been married now to my lovely wife. We're going to be celebrating next year. I think it's, my math tells me right, 25 years. We've been together for 31 years. 
and I can, I think, have my wife next to me here right now, and you can ask her if I throw ever things on her face about her past or anything to do with her life. And she does very good at the same thing, too, which for a woman, a boy wifey. <laughs> we need to learn to bury the wrong in the ocean of God's forgetfulness. That's where it needs to be buried. Because I know you remember how God forgave you. Did he not say your sin I will remember what? No more. He, don't, he doesn't throw our failures in our face. And you might say, well, you know, I don't get to talk to God like that. Well, listen, he told you in his word. Because I don't know if you know this, by the way. The Bible is God's character revelation to his people, to his creation. It's not just a bunch of stories for you to feel good about them or for you to not feel good about them. It's for you to understand what his character is towards his creation. That's the bottom line of what the Bible is. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God doesn't have a problem with his memory. He, he, he just chooses to tell you by saying that I will not remember your sins. I'm not going to shove them in your face again. Hebrews 10, 17, then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Hebrews 8, 12, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So if we have totally and finally forgiven somebody, or finally and totally, whichever way you want me to say it again, we will not keep bringing up the past. I know that you've been on the receiving end of that. When somebody has supposedly, quote unquote, forgiven you about something, and then some kind of a situation happens, and next thing you know, you're like, I thought you forgave me for that. I thought we went over that already. What happened? That's in the past. And there you are again. You're like, so you didn't really forgive me. We didn't move past that situation. So, as we begin to wrap it up, we have improperly assumed that since God forgives and reconciles only on the basis of repentance, that we get the chance to demand the same. I mentioned this earlier, and I wanted to make sure that I mentioned it at least a couple of times. That true reconciliation can only happen when both parties agree to the reconciliation. The person that may be receiving the forgiveness might not desire to reconcile. Bible does tell us that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, but that's for us to help humanity to be reconciled to God. So what do we learn today from these verses? The first thing we learn is that we need to deal with the problem one-to-one -one without the involvement of others for the first step. For the purpose of communication and character development, but ultimately to initiate a path to forgiveness. In continuation of that, if that approach is not received, establish the evidence by bringing one or two people. Lastly, if that's not resolved, tell the whole church. And if the person is not willing, you have to put them out. So the most important fact that I want to impress upon you today, if you're unable to reconcile your differences, you must still practice forgiving that person, whoever that may be. This is not for their benefit, by the way. This is for your benefit, and it's for your benefit with God. Because if you don't do that, we're going to be reverting right back to the teaching that I spoke to you last week. Not last week, five weeks ago. Four or five, something like that. Somewhere in there. You're going to be right back to harboring a root of bitterness. And you don't want that to spring into anything else. And in case you don't recall me telling you this the last time, bitterness is the one ingredient that eats its container from the inside out. <clears throat> Give that a serious consideration. Amen? Amen? Father, we are so thankful 
that your word makes it evidently clear to what it is that you expect from each and every one of us whenever there's a conflict that arises. Our Lord and Savior explained it so well. I pray and hope that that explanation provided today challenges someone to change, to correct that which is maybe long overdue between one, two, however many parties. You know our heart. You know the condition of it. You know exactly what each and every one of us need to do to correct. Not self-correct, but allow you to correct. For you are our maker. You are our guide. We are your clay in your potting hands. Mold us into that which you desire for us to be molded into. Simply because we want to bring you glory. We want to bring you glory by whatever it is that we think, say, and do. And we know that there's nothing, there's no attribute that will make us look anything more like you than being able to forgive. Well, that's what you're in the business of doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.